Never think that war, no matter how necessary, nor how justified, is not a crime. Ernest Hemingway War is a cruel place for a kind person, and though the Primarchs were generals bred for war, there has always been one that has struggled with being a living weapon. Vulcan, Primarch of the Salamanders, is described as the most human of all the Primarchs, and was known for his dislike of war. An outlook on life established by his upbringing and the life he experienced as a Primarch of a Space Marine Legion. The beginning of his story starts with his gestation capsule being torn from the Emperor's side by the dark powers of the Immaterium. Hurtled through the maddening and dangerous warp, the gestation capsule was spit out into real space towards the planet of Nocturne, located in the Ultima Segmentum, a death world. A planet with great deserts, acidic deltas, inland seas and oceans. Though as a result of tectonic stresses produced by the gravitational pull of its moon Prometheus, there are vast chains of arctic volcanoes scattered across the planet's surface, combined with frequent earthquakes. Unfortunately, these constant volcanic eruptions have covered the world in a cloak of dust and ash. It obscures most sunlight to the surface. Any sense of stability on this dangerous world is fleeting, as once every 15 Terran years, Prometheus and Nocturne approach so closely that the planet is almost torn to pieces by the resulting gravitic stresses. This is called the Time of Trial. Vast tidal waves crash across the seas, extreme weather temperature changes, thousands of volcanic explosions, the ash further blotting out the sun, while powerful earthquakes constantly ravage the land. You would think that on such a dangerous world, it would destroy any inhabitants. But you would be wrong, and Nocturne teems with life, even in the least expected places. One of the larger volcanic mountains on Nocturne is named Mount Deathfire. This is where massive, great fire-resistant reptiles called salamanders live. Even the deserts teem with prehistoric-looking reptiles and creatures. Hard places often breed hardened people, and by some miracle, humanity exists on Nocturne, in the form of numerous tribes. Strangely enough, the people of Nocturne have been slightly mutated by their constant exposure to the high levels of radiation born from constant eruptions. They have developed deep ebony skins, regardless of their original ethnicities and the irises of their eyes now glow red in the darkness. Over many generations they have evolved the ability to see into the infrared levels of electromagnetic spectrum to deal with this constant volcanic pollution that blocks out their world's light. On this world of near constant night, like a blazing comet, the infant Vulcan in the 30th millennium burned through the atmosphere of Nocturne in his gestation capsule, crashing directly into the home of a black smiter, a blacksmith by the name of Nebel, in the city settlement of Hesioid. In the crater that was the home, Nebel found a child, a human descending from the sky. Perhaps this boy was the one prophesied to be a saviour by the teachings of Nocturne's set of religious and cultural beliefs, the Promethean cult. Nobel saw this boy as a gift to Nocturne, and may have believed that he was given him as a sacred task. So he took in this child as his own, and named him Vulcan. Like all the Primarchs, Vulcan grew very quickly reaching full adulthood by the age of only three Terran years. He was also highly intelligent, able to vastly improve the already considerable metalworking skills of the famed smiths of Nocturne. Quickly he had risen in strength and wisdom, embracing the culture which had taken him up, working in his adopted father's forge. Vulcan was raised with all the knowledge they could offer him, but most importantly, they gave him love and community. Unfortunately, during Vulcan's fourth year, Hesioid was attacked by the Dark Eldar, who were on a slave-taking expedition. The people of his hometown hid, as they usually did when the decadent Xenos came raiding. These cruel Xenos were attacking his home, 
his community. Vulcan refused to hide. Armed with only a pair of blacksmith's hammers, he roused the people from hiding and drove back the assault, single-handedly slaying a hundred Dark Eldar. As word of this defiance spread, the headsmen of seven of the most important settlements on the planet came to pay homage to Vulcan, swearing to fight rather than let fear prevail. He was the Fireborn, a legendary defender whose superhuman strength had defied the foul Xenos. In celebration of the Primarchs of victory over the Dark Eldar, a tournament of various contests involving tests of strength and craftsmanship common to the people of Nocturne was held. As the contestants gathered, a pale stranger the size of Vulcan appeared, claiming he could best any man at the competition causing many people to laugh at the comparison to the superhuman Vulcan. Vulcan accepted the challenge, and the stranger wagered that whoever lost the challenge would swear his eternal loyalty and obedience to the victor. With a smile at such a boast, Vulcan agreed to the stranger's terms. Many of the contests had to be called a draw between Vulcan and the pale stranger, for there was simply no way to determine a victor. For instance, the anvil lift, where the contestants were required to hold an anvil aloft above their heads for as long as possible. It ended in a tie, when the two superhuman competitors both held anvils aloft for half a day, with no sign of tiring, while all the other competitors had given up after mere minutes. Time and time again, each contest ended in a draw, and by the end Vulcan and the stranger were tied. The elders devised one last, definitive test, both contestants were given 24 hours to forge a weapon before using that weapon to hunt down and slay one of Nocturne's most deadly reptilians, a salamander. The final contest was to determine who would swear eternal loyalty to the victor. The final trial had begun, the salamander slaying. Vulcan and the pale stranger began the forging of their weapons that they could bring down the beasts with. They worked all day at their forges, neither pausing to rest. As the day drew to a close, they emerged. Vulcan had forged a huge warhammer, and the stranger a keen-edged sword. Like the beginning of a great quest or epic, the two superhumans climbed to the summit of Mount Deathfire. The volcano is said to be the home of the largest fire drake salamanders, the deadliest creature the planet had to offer. After hours of searching through the ash and the smog-ridden slopes, Vulcan found his prey first, smashing its head off with a single blow from his hammer. As he carried the carcass back, disaster struck as the volcano unexpectedly erupted. Vulcan was nearly thrown off a cliff, but managed to grab onto the edge with one hand, stubbornly grasping the tail of his prize with the other. Vulcan had the inhuman strength of a Primarch and held on for several hours, but his hold eventually began to slip. Was this the end for the young Primarch? A fall down to a fiery death in lava? or drop his prize and swear eternal loyalty to a stranger. It was at that time the stranger reappeared, carrying a salamander larger than his own. The stranger quickly threw his carcass into the lava flow, using the heat-resistant hide as a bridge to cross over and save Vulcan. Vulcan was declared the winner when he returned home, since he had a salamander hide and the stranger had lost his. But Vulcan silenced the crowd, he knelt before the stranger. This man could have won easily, but he sacrificed his pride because he valued the life of his opponent more. Vulcan declared that any man who valued life over human pride was worthy of his service. At that moment, the stranger at last revealed himself to the Primarch, his true nature as the Emperor of Mankind, his true father. Vulcan's father had need of his service, for there was a great mission, 
a great crusade to reunite all of the colonies of mankind across the stars and protect them from Xenos like the Dark Eldar. The Emperor told Vulcan, I won't lie, there has been blood spilled on this journey and there will be more. I never imagined the enlightenment of mankind would be an easy task, nor one accomplished without violence, however regrettable. The Emperor's eye seemed to cloud over for a moment then, lost in abstract thought. I have had failures, some of which I shall never speak of. My brothers? The Emperor did not answer, and that was answer enough. Will you not tell me of them? Are they like me? Utterly unlike you, said the Emperor, brightening. And that is your single greatest trait, my proudest achievement. To conquer the galaxy and expand the Imperium of Man, Vulcan had not the strength to do it alone. He would do it at the head of an army of warriors implanted with his gene seed. The 18th Legiones Astartes, the Dragon Warriors Legion, his sons. The creation of the 18th was established largely in separation from the rest, as it is generally thought to be created for very specific ends. There were none save perhaps a handful of the Emperor's closest and earliest allies who knew the facts regarding this mystery. What was clear early on was that the gene seed of Vulcan had a low success rate amongst recruits. Many young boys upon terror would die in the recruitment of this legion, but those who survived joined the Brotherhood. Combined with the slow recruitment, the legion, even in its earliest engagements, had gained a reputation. They often achieved a victory against impossible odds and survived, although barely taking heavy losses, which reduced the new legion's active strength from around 20,000 to little more than a thousand warriors. Although in doing so they secured themselves a place of glory and honour in the psyche of the Imperium's forces. For an Imperial Army unit to be assigned alongside the 18th Legion was a sign that the forthcoming battle would be a dangerous affair. Be it to break a siege, disrupt a counter-attack, or hold the line against an alien onslaught in order to protect civilians, they would plunge into the deadliest phrase, holding the line for others. But in doing so, their casualties were enormous. This battle doctrine had almost seemed like a death wish. This constant self-sacrifice was morally right, but tactically flawed. This battle doctrine is not something new as seen within our own history with a last stand at the Battle of Thermopylae. In 480 BCE, Xerxes led a vast army over land, accompanied by a substantial fleet moving along the coast. His forces quickly seized the northern Greece and began moving south. The Greek resistance tried to halt the Persian progress on land at the narrow pass of Thermopylae. The Greek army was led by Leonitas, who was estimated to have around 7,000 men. Xerxes, on the other hand, had anywhere between 70,000 to 300,000. The Greek strategy involved holding a line only a few dozen yards long between a steep hillside and the sea. This constricted battlefield had prevented the Persians from utilizing their vast numbers. For two days, the Greeks defended against the Persian attacks and suffered light losses as they imposed heavy casualties on the Persian army. But the Greeks were betrayed and were now facing encirclement. But 300 Spartans and a few Greek allies stayed, knowing that this meant their death. Like the dragon warriors, they could have used guerrilla tactics, denying battle, or other options, but they stayed and held the line because it meant that others would survive. It was a guaranteed death, but like the Greeks at Thermopylae, the ethos of the dragon warriors meant that they had gone beyond the fear of death, but that very defiance of fear meant that they would suffer the losses of countless brothers.
Vulcan had been found by the Emperor and was set on the path to become the leader of the Dragon Warriors Legion, but in truth he was not ready. Vulcan was strong and fiercely intelligent, but he had no experience of true war. He had spent most of his life as a blacksmith and the occasional hunter, so for a number of years after his discovery, he stayed alongside the Emperor under his direct tutelage, during which time his presence was kept a secret from the wide of the Imperium. During this period, Vulcan learned with frightening speed and comprehension, studying in the arts of war, history, science, constantly displaying his ferocious intelligence, and also wisdom and compassion that were perhaps at odds with the role he had been destined to play as a Primarch. It was in his training that Vulcan met with his brother Primarch, Ferris Manus of the Iron Hands. As Vulcan engaged in his first battle, the Emperor and Ferris observed the new Primarch. He is impressive, he admitted, then turned disdainful. But Russ and Horus, even Fulgrim, they match his prowess. I see nothing special about him. You'll see, said the Emperor. And he did, as it was their common love of forging and creation that bonded the two Primarchs. Ferris was stubborn and abrasive at times, and pursued the glory offered in war, almost the complete opposite of the humble and passive Vulcan. But in a strange way, they complemented each other, Though they walked different paths, they still had the same destination. Perhaps being with Ferris, another Primarch, Vulcan had met an equal. As with any of his brothers, they often felt a sense of loneliness being so different compared to the average human. As the brothers bonded, Vulcan and Ferris fought side by side, finally giving Vulcan the experience and wisdom he needed to assume the leadership of his own legion. When Vulcan came to his legion, it was in the hour of their greatest need. The 18th, led by their Lord Commander Cassian Vaughn, had become caught in the rearguard defence of a cluster colony worlds against a wave of orcs. With the other forces of the Imperium engaged elsewhere, this dangerous task was left to the 18th legion, the Dragon Warriors. Fighting against vast and overwhelming odds, the Legion's primary forces, numbering some 19,000 Space Marines, had marshaled the local defenders and held out for nearly a standard year, repelling battles against well over a million orcs, scattered across hundreds of ramshackle ships, asteroid vessels, and dozens of space hulks. The actions of the Legion had allowed the evacuation of three entire planetary populations to safety, but at a terrible cost. As the conflict progressed, their casualties became insurmountable. Brothers and friends were dying. They even suffered the grievous wounding of their commander. The remainder of the 18th had become all but trapped on the death world of Antiem, a lightning rod drawing the orcs to battle them. As they bled the orc forces, they saved countless human lives. But the stubborn resolve of the 18th meant that they would not retreat. They would succeed or die as they had done for decades. Was he truly ready? He had to be, as Vulcan learned of the dire situation his legion was in. They were on the brink of annihilation, and Vulcan had learned early in his life to never abandon those in need of help. But when Vulcan would arrive, he would not do so alone, for he brought with him 3,000 new initiates, the first of the Legion to be raised from Nocturne, along with a host of new warships, war machines and arms, all fabricated to the Primarch's own exacting specifications. They fell upon the orcs like a hammer, and shattered the largest of the space hulks orbiting Antium. Spurred on by his unexpected aid, the rest of the 18th hurled themselves in a renewed fury at the orcs besieging them, slaughtering and scattering the green-skinned Xenos before them. In the aftermath, the two halves of the 18th legion met 
and were unified upon Antium's dead coral plains. As the survivors removed their helms, and the Terran legionaries looked upon the face of their brothers, they saw their gene father. They could not help but know that they were one, and their Primarch had come to claim them. The survivors of the Terran 18th knelt immediately. No, said Vulcan. Rise, my sons. I am your father, not your king. We do not kneel in fealty. They looked up at him, and after a hesitation, got to their feet again. Vulcan was not finished. Kneeling is an act of respect. It is a tribute that must be earned, and you have earned it. He knelt, and the legion in its entirety murmured in awe. Your sacrifices to save the people of Tarsus Division will be remembered forever. You performed what was the impossible, and made this sacrifice without hesitation, knowing your task doomed you, and that it was thankless. But I give you my thanks now. He bowed his head. Seeking out the mortally wounded Lord Commander Vaughn, he confirmed the formal transfer of the Legion's mastery by presenting the fallen warrior with the broken power claw of the Orc Warlord, the one who had struck him down, to seal the pact between him and his Legion. They would fight for him, but he would fight for them in turn. Understanding Vulcan is to see that uniquely amongst his brothers, he had true humility. He was a Primarch, but he saw his life no more important than any others. All of humanity was his equal. After the battle at Antiam, Vulcan set about remaking and reforging his legion, teaching his Terran-born sons the Promethean Creed, the cultural teachings of Nocturne that prayed selflessness but in turn tempered the self-sacrificial nature of the Legion. Vulcan and his sons were one unified force. In honour of this new beginning, the 18th became the Salamanders, named after the fiery drakes of Nocturne, dangerous and filled with the will of inner fire. The Salamanders, a united legion, a combination of the Terran-born veterans with new homeworld recruits often breeds resentments in other space marine legions. In this, Vulcan was wise enough to retain and value the experience of the Terran veterans, and he showed them respect and held them in high esteem for what they had accomplished. Vulcan accomplished this by making the Terrans foremost warriors his pyre guard, his Praetorians. The elite body of the chapter that would serve both as his honour guard and paragons are the standards that he would set for his legion. For the fallen first master Cassius Vaughn, Vulcan fashioned with his own hands a unique dreadnought sarcophagus, the Iron Dragon, so that Vaughn could serve as a Castellian and protector of the Prometheus and the future of the legion. Vulcan had saved his sons and assumed the mantle of leadership of the legion. With years of battlefield experience and tutelage under Ferris and the Emperor, he could finally enact the purpose he was created for. The Salamanders joined at the forefront of the Great Crusade, smashing Xenos empires and bringing lost worlds into compliance as part of the Imperium. Although it would never reach the high numbers of legionary strength like the Dark Angels or Iron Warriors, the Legion's power and battle prowess was undeniable and its conduct in war was regarded as exemplary. It had been tempered, retraining the fearlessness and savage spirit for which Vulcan had been renowned, but those traits were now governed and kept in check by stoicism, lack of hubris, teachings of the Promethean Creed. Vulcan had brought his legion focus, purpose, and wisdom. It was now said of the Salamanders that they were neither quick to anger, nor prone to rush blindly into battle as they once had been, but once they had decided to unleash their wrath, it was unstoppable, terrifying. There are three things all wise men fear. 
the sea in the storm, a night with no moon, and the anger of a gentle man. Vulcan was a reflection of the teachings of the Promethean Creed. Humble, wise and noble, but at the end of the day, he was a living weapon. Buried within him was a fury any enemy should be wary of unleashing. The Great Crusade was spreading across the galaxy. For over 200 years, Vulcan and his sons went from war zone to war zone, imparting imperial compliance. Though Vulcan was a great warrior, there would be one act of compliance that would forever change his feelings on war. The world of Caldera, known as Ibsen by its inhabitants. The Salamanders were tasked with bringing this newly discovered world into compliance, led by Vulcan himself. The 18th Legion was joined by the Iron Hands and Death Guard Legions, both led by their own respective Primarchs. Caldera was largely inhospitable to human life, but possessed valuable mineral deposits. However, the Imperial forces faced stiff resistance for control of the planet from the Eldar, who had placed a garrison. The mystery deepened when the semi-feral primitive human tribes inhabiting the planet seemed more sympathetic to the Eldar or at the very least not welcoming to their human liberators. This was a common problem that the Salamanders came across, some of the tall, obsidian-skinned warriors with piercing red eyes. Common humans were often afraid at the sight of them. After defeating the Craftworld Eldar, Vulcan learned that they were guiding a webway portal. They had found a crude warding ceremony taking place, conducted by the primitive human tribal priests, attempting to sacrifice a Dark Eldar Witch. Vulcan had learned that the primitive humans had worshipped the Craftworld Eldar, as they had inadvertently set them free from their previous Dark Eldar oppressors. The people of this world were mad, violent and unfortunately irredeemable. Vulcan reluctantly ordered the world to be cleansed by flame. It was perhaps the first time in his life where Vulcan had truly failed and he was forced to destroy an entire human population. Vulcan loved crafting and forging, like on his homeworld of Nocturne, not butchering civilizations. Though he agreed with the Great Crusade, he clearly had begun to disdain the cruelty of war. Not long after the successful conclusion of this campaign, Vulcan and his Salamander's Legion participated in another joint Imperial compliance action on the world known as Karatan, alongside the Primarch Conrad Kurz and his Night Lord's Legion. During this campaign, Vulcan was disgusted with his brother Conrad, and how his legion brutally conducted themselves. During one notable incident, the Night Lord slaughtered the inhabitants of an entire city in order to seed fear amongst the general population. Vulcan was beyond furious. How could his brother be so vile and cruel to innocence just caught up in war? His fury led to a brief conflict between the two. After the successful conclusion of this campaign, Vulcan reported Kurz's conduct to both Warmaster Horus and his brother Primarch Rogal Dawn. These two Primarchs were almost the complete opposite of each other. Conrad was raised alone on the cold streets of Nostromo whereas Vulcan was raised in a home with family, community and love. Conrad relied on these tactics of terror, fear and denying battle, whereas Vulcan would fight head on, shielding the innocent. This disdain for each other would only grow over the final years of the Great Crusade, leading to consequences down the line. The inconceivable happened. After 200 years of war dedicated to the Imperium of Man, Horus Lupercal of the Sons of Horus betrayed the Emperor. Vulcan and Korax arrived first into the traitor's location, and found four legions fortified upon the world of Istvan V. They were weary of their position, 
but upon learning that four remaining legions were mere hours away, the newly arrived Ferris Manus convinced his brothers Korox and Vulcan to attack immediately. And so began one of the bloodiest battles in the history of the Imperium. Previous friends and allies clashed in a storm of hate. Horus had once been Vulcan's friend, the first found son that most of the Primarchs looked up to, but Horus had betrayed them, and the vision of their father, a galaxy at peace. The Iron Hands and Raven Guard and Salamanders clashed against the traitors, Vulcan and Ferris unleashing their primordial strength. Power as furious as the fire in the forge. The first wave attack was smashing against the traitor's line, but for every meter gained, hundreds of Vulcan's sons fell. The loyalists had pushed deep, but with the arrival of the four reinforcing legions, they could finally have some respite, and so they retreated. Ferris was too stubborn and pushed forward onto Fulgrim, whilst Vulcan and Korax retreated back, finally seeing their reinforcements. But as they hailed them, something was wrong. The Salamanders and Raven Guard could get no answer on the Vox. A haunting silence hung in the air until broken by a flare from Horus's command site. The reinforcing Iron Warriors, Alpha Legion, Night Lords, and word bearers open fire on the loyalists, catching them completely by surprise. All around him, Vulcan saw his sons slaughtered, dying in their thousands. Terran sons that he had knelt to. Sons of the people who had raised him on Nocturne. This betrayal of his brother Primarch was cutting Vulcan to the core, far deeper and more painful than any wound. Vulcan became enraged fighting with the strength of a thousand men trying to save his sons, but it was all for naught. As Perturabo sent a nuclonic missile into the heart of the Salamanders, the 18th Legion, the defenders of the innocent were gone within seconds, emulated in their own armor. Men who had fought, trained, and laughed together were gone. He was alive. Somehow Vulcan had survived the heart of a nuclear explosion, regenerating thanks to his Primarch genetics, but in truth he knew he should be dead. Around him was the smouldering ruins of his sons, all gone. As the ashes of the Legion blew away in the wind, the forces of the traitors were approaching. There was no escape, but he would not go down so easily, and lashed out at the traitors but was eventually overwhelmed by sheer numbers of the enemy and was shot, stabbed and bludgeoned into unconsciousness. When the Salamander's Primarch finally awoke, he found himself fettered in massive chains above a Gaurok hulk, belonging to the Night Lords. To his horror, Vulcan saw that he was taken prisoner by the one brother he disliked on a fundamental level, Conrad Kurz. Over the span of several months, the Night Haunter took sadistic pleasure in attempting to break both Vulcan's body and mind. Months of continuous, gruelling torture, physical pain beyond human comprehension, and psychological horror in the form of twisted games, ending in Vulcan taking innocent life against his will. After one particularly mad display by Conrad, he snapped and beheaded his brother. But to Conrad's immense surprise, Vulcan's body began regenerating. Vulcan had survived Istvan and Conrad's murder. Vulcan was immortal. He was like the Emperor, a perpetual. This caused Conrad to have a psychotic break, continuing to murder his brother thousands of times. But Vulcan returned after each death, only increasing the madness of the Night Haunter. Becoming sick of his brother's existence, Vulcan's fate would be decided in a duel to the death. Conrad offered his brother a means of escape. All he had to do was navigate a labyrinth, where, at its center, lay his personal warhammer Dawnbringer. But this was no ordinary maze. At the request of the Night Haunter, the Iron Warrior's Primarch Perturabo had crafted a special prison. 
whose featureless walls and strange geometric design had made it all but impossible to map and escape. Anyone who attempted to mentally map the labyrinth would find that it was hopeless. Conrad toyed with Vulcan, wounding him constantly but denying death. Vulcan was at the edge of his sanity. He had lost an entire legion of his sons, his friends. His brother Ferris had died on Isfan. He had been tormented for years. It was in the moment of his greatest suffering that he had a vision of the Emperor in the form of a remembrancer. The Emperor reminded his son that he would watch over all of them when he could, and he calmed Vulcan's mind. Vulcan remembered that the fire that burned within was greater than anything Conrad could do to him. Vulcan goaded Conrad, calling him a weak and pitiful creature, that all of the brothers looked down upon him, that Vulcan had always held back as he was afraid of breaking him. Finally at the centre of the labyrinth, Vulcan found Dawnbreaker. Conrad still taunted Vulcan, asking him if he really thought he could teleport to safety. Vulcan answered, You're right. I'd fashioned it as a teleporter, a means of escape even a prison such as this. I counted on you leading me here, on you needing to face me one last time. It seems I was fooled into thinking you had planned for this, but you're forgetting one thing. It's also a hammer. Vulcan proceeded to beat the Night Haunter into a pulp. As a physically strongest Primarch, it was like being smashed by a literal mountain. Buying some respite, Vulcan activated the secret teleporter built into the head of the Warhammer. Vulcan was immediately transported halfway across the galaxy and reappeared in the upper atmosphere of the Ultramarine Legion's homeworld of McCrag. Like a blazing comet, Vulcan began falling to the surface of McCrag, the impact of his body shuddering the surrounding earth. What was left of the Primarch was a smouldering pile of flesh and charred bone. But as he did on Isfarn V, the Lord of Drakes rose again. As the forces of Ultramar had discovered his corpse that had fallen from orbit, they were baffled as to how this was possible. He was dead, Lord. And then he was not. Life returned where life was not and could not be. He healed. You do not heal from death, Gilliman roared. Gilliman, Lionel Johnson and Sanguinius in the Imperium Secundus had found their beloved brother alive, but something was wrong. Vulcan was insane. All the years of gruelling torture combined with crashing into a literal planet had scrambled the sanity of Vulcan. He was not the kind, humble Vulcan of Nocturne. He was an insane beast, lashing out at all the unfamiliar before him. Unfortunately for Vulcan, he was in serious danger. The Night Haunter, who was trapped aboard the Dark Angel's flagship following a failed boarding action during the conclusion of the Thrammer's Crusade, would eventually make his way to the surface of McCrag, wanting to finish what he had started and finally kill Vulcan. Escaping his confines, the raving mad Vulcan battled the insane Conrad Kurz. He was aided by a perpetual named John Grammaticus. The perpetual had come to give Conrad a piece of fulgurite, a large, natural hollow glass tube formed from beneath the surface of a planet during a lightning strike. This was a result of the Emperor unleashing his infinite psychic power. As the two mad demigods clashed, it would be the Eldar Farseer Eldrad who managed to convince John to forsake the Cabal Masters and choose humanity. Feeling like a traitor to his own for so long, John made his choice. He took the Fulgurite and stabbed Vulcan through the chest. The Primarch became still as the night. John had decided to side with humanity and sacrificed his perpetual nature to cure the Primarch's madness, but Vulcan was unmoving, showing no signs of life.
A lifeless Vulcan was mourned by the loyalist Summer Crag. The three legions and a myriad of survivors from Istvan. Matters, however, soon changed when First Captain Artelius Numion was successfully saved by an ultramarine strike force. Many of those amongst the survivors had hoped that their return of their first captain would give them a new sense of purpose to what remained of the legion. Numion was a close friend of Vulcan, standing by his side for centuries. He refused to believe that he was dead. It was inconceivable to him. Coming together, the 67 surviving salamanders formed a new brotherhood, the Pyre, and declared their intent. They would attempt to break through the ruin storm to return Vulcan to Nocturne to be properly laid to rest. As their journey encroached upon Nocturne, they were pursued by both the Death Guard and the Word Bearers that had followed the Battle Barge's course intent on claiming the Primarch's body and the mighty weapon still lodged in his chest. In a last desperate gamble, the battle barge sacrificed itself on the guns of the enemy to allow the twenty survivors of the Pyre, among them Numion, to evacuate Vulcan's casket in a Thunderhawk ship to Nocturne surface. But the ruse was quickly discovered, and the Thunderhawk was soon severely damaged, causing it to crash land on the surface. But the Pyre were not alone. The Salamander's garrison of Nocturne sallied out to their brothers, in turn slaughtering the Death Guard pursuers. With the enemy defeated and Nocturne safe, the proper ceremony was conducted to remember Vulcan's passing. All 700 of the last Salamanders in the galaxy dressed in their regalia and performed the final rites of their Primarch. The Salamanders mourned their Primarch, their father, a man who had been a kind and honourable example to them, the one person that they had truly believed in. Their father's body was carried into the fiery heart of Nocturne's sacred mountain, Mount Deathfire, as was the way of the Promethean Creed. In the words of Vulcan, ours is a violent calling, but as adherents to the Promethean Creed, we believe in the circle of fire. None can come back as they once were, but in death we are returned to the ash, from whence we came to be born anew, our blood and bone bonded with the earth. Through fire our remains are made protean, through fire and the reunion with the earth do we experience rebirth. After death our duty is ended, we give ourselves to the elements, and in so doing become part of them. This is the nature of the circle of fire. No miracle had come. First Captain Artelius Numion was racked by grief. He was a soldier raised in the Imperial truth, but in his heart he knew that this could not be the end for his Primarch. He had faith. Discarding his armor and weapons, Numion scaled Mount Deathfire, and in a leap of faith he sacrificed himself to the mountain swallowed up in its fire. Realizing the absence of their first captain, the salamanders raced after Numion, mounting jet bikes which were by far the swiftest way to travel. As the legionaries raced to the Mount Deathfire, they found a solitary figure kneeling in the desert. Rejoicing at having found their comrade and friend, they approached, but as they came close, they fell to their knees. They saw the figure rise unsteadily to his feet, a hand clutching an all too familiar spear tip embedded in his chest. It was their Primarch, their father, Vulcan lived. Vulcan lived. The sacrifice of his friend had brought him out of his deep slumber and had healed his fractured psyche. When he first awakened, he found himself in the depths of Mount Deathfire, conversing with an old man, calling himself Deathfire personified. The man urged Vulcan to travel to Terra and led the Primarch to two items that he had no memory of forging, the Thunderhammer Urdracul and the Talisman of Seven Hammers. 
When Vulcan awoke, he was at the steps of Mount Deathfire and was discovered by three of his legionaries, Atok Ambedemi, Barak Zytos, and Egen Gargo. He had endured so much over the Horus heresy, but Vulcan knew that the Emperor needed his strength. The Primarch used his talisman to open a webway portal deep below Nocturne, perhaps the one that had once terrorized his home in his youth. Vulcan and his three sons entered the webway, traversing its corridors they eventually found themselves in the realm of Kamora, battling Dark Eldar. They next found themselves with a remnant of Iron Hand's fleet called the Cult of the Gorgon, an order claiming that it had resurrected Ferris Manus. But upon meeting the supposed reborn Ferris, Vulcan discovered it to be little more than a mechanical puppet with one of Ferris's metallical arms attached, a disgusting mockery of one of his greatest friends and brothers. He destroyed the false puppet once again reminded of the cruelty of war that the heresy had brought. After many more harrowing fights, Vulcan and his sons finally made it to Terra with the assistance of Eldrad Ulthran, putting them before the Imperial Palace. It was here where Vulcan would reunite with his brother Rogal Dawn of the Imperial Fists. It had been before Istvan since they had last spoken. I would embrace you, brother, Vulcan confessed, but... That was never your way, Dawn laughed gruffly. Abstination is a wise decision. Vulcan embraced him firmly anyway. Vulcan has always been said to be the most human of the Primarchs, but this is because he had love. He truly loved his father and brothers, as a family would. Even when they had the opportunity to end the insane Conrad curse, he could not, for he loved even him. His greatest strength and weakness. The Emperor, now trapped on the throne, revealed that he had not only been expecting Vulcan, but had been guiding him the entire journey, and had been the force that compelled him to construct the Talisman of Seven Hammers. Vulcan became horrified at the revelation of what he had created, a doomsday device. He loved to build, not destroy. How could his father ask him to make such a thing? It was because the Emperor trusted his son. Even on the plains of Nocturne he saw his humanity, and he knew only Vulcan could be trusted with the responsibility of it. Keeping his existence a secret, save for a select few during the Siege of Terror, Vulcan held his post at the Eternity Gate, until Magnus the Red and a group of his thousand sons had infiltrated the Imperial Dungeon to kill the Emperor. Vulcan blocked a lethal blow by Magnus's staff that had been intended for the Emperor upon the Golden Throne, but quickly backed down and alongside his father, they bid Magnus to return to the Imperial Fold. Vulcan and Magnus were once friends, and he desperately wanted him to rejoin them, but Magnus refused the offer to return after the Emperor told him he would have to purge his legion. Vulcan pitied his brother, in his shoes he would have made the same choice but he had no choice, and battled Magnus. The duel was furious, and Magnus' abilities almost killed Vulcan, but he was saved from a decapitating blow thanks to the sacrifice of Eigen Gargo. Again, Vulcan had a friend die for him. A primordial rage consumed Vulcan, and he unleashed a torrent of blows so strong that not even the powers of Magnus could stop it. He had beaten the Crimson King into a bloody pulp. Such was the retribution of the physically strongest Primarch, but this resulted in his brother's allegiance to chaos. Vulcan had protected his father and held his post until tragedy struck. The Emperor had slain Horus, but was so mortally wounded he was interned on a golden throne. A corpse Emperor. It had been 1,500 years since the end of the Horus Heresy. Over time, we all change. But what defines your character is the ideals you stand by throughout life. Vulcan had learned compassion, love of craftsmanship, and most importantly, humanity on Nocturne. That even as a warrior in the Great Crusade, he still put his life at risk for others, even when he did not have to. That even when he had the brother who tortured him at his mercy, he spared him. 
that not even death could stop him from fighting for humanity, that he wanted to create, to craft, and not destroy, even going so far as to destroy many of his own creations in fear of their misuse. The time of the Emperor and the Primarchs almost seems like a distant memory now. One by one were the Loyalist Primarchs gone, leaving Vulcan the last son in the Imperium, a likely very lonely existence. The Imperium now was not the same since the Heresy, mired in politics and infighting. I think all of these factors led Vulcan to the deserved conclusion that he had enough of war, its cruelty and destruction. For in peace sons bury their fathers, but in war fathers bury their sons. Vulcan would be seen last in the Imperium in the disastrous War of the Beast. The Imperium had become threatened by an orc war the size of which had never been seen before. The Imperium was on its knees and they needed help, and they turned to Vulcan who had been watching over the planet of Caldera the place of his greatest failure during the Great Crusade. Vulcan was tired of being a warring general, but once he heard that the orcs were amassing on Ulanor, he knew the situation was dire. In the Imperial assault upon the world, Vulcan confronted the Beast, an enormous orc warboss who matched his strength in combat. Seeing no other way, he detonated the generator causing a chain reaction that shattered the temple gargan and seemingly obliterating them both. Vulcan was presumed dead by the Imperium. However, the Salamanders still hunt him in the 41st millennium. They believe he will return to them after they have found all nine of the artifacts of Vulcan. The Lord of Drakes is without doubt one of the greatest champions of the Imperium, the most human of all the Primarchs. And I have no doubt out there in the grim darkness of the far future, Vulcan lives.